rest of today, what we'll do is we'll talk about adsorption of pollutants. We'll talk both about adsorption and absorption. Talk about absorption probably on Wednesday. With adsorption, we're looking at the mass transfer of a gas onto a solid support. Ad adsorption is what occurs, for instance, if you had a friend over and friend smoking a cigarette, and after the friend, friend, friend leaves, you notice the smell of cigarette smoke on your curtains or on your furniture, the cloth. What's happened is those chemicals have adsorbed, they're essentially sticking or adhering to the solid support. So we talk about a adsorbate, so continuing with the toluene, for instance. So we're removing toluene. It is the adsorbate, and it is being removed on the adsorbent. So your adsorbent, for instance, could be activated carbon, your charcoal, could be the fabric on the curtains hanging on your wall. Now we'll talk about forces of adsorption. We talk about physical, and these are weak forces. They're weak electrostatic or van der Waals forces or chemical, which are much stronger binding forces. These are covalent or hydrogen bonding. And these reactions are often reversible. So some of the common adsorbents that we use in the industry are activated carbon, silica, and alumina. So I've given you this um, table just to give you a sense of the properties of these materials. And just for reference, a size five soccer ball has a surface area of 3.34 times 10 to the minus three meters squared per gram of material. So if weigh a soccer, size five soccer ball at weight, based on its weight and the area, surface area, it has a surface area, as you mentioned, about 3.3 times 10 to the minus three meters squared per gram. Notice this. With activated carbon, we're looking at somewhere between 600, so just looking at activated carbon, somewhere between 600 and 1600 meters squared per gram. We're talking six orders of magnitude, greater surface area. Activated alumina, not quite as much surface area per gram. Synthetic polymers, in cases somewhere typically around 1,000 to 1,100 meters squared per gram. So where does all this area come from? Soccer ball, we're just looking at this outside area. So that's our soccer ball. Just thinking of a very big soccer ball. That's not the case in these other materials. So your activated carbon, your silica, your alumina, your synthetic polymers. These are extremely porous materials. And it's these pore spaces where most of the adsorption occur. We refer to these in larger ones as macro pores. And then as we go deeper into the carbon grain, we form smaller pores, or there are smaller pores, and those are referred to as micropores. Typically, the rate limiting step is not adsorption. Adsorption, once that molecule reaches a site, the sorption, the actual process of attaching to that site occurs very rapid. So what is the rate limiting? How does that molecule end up 
in the pore space. So shown up here, we have these molecules at the surface. How is that molecule going to move into the pores? What's the process? Is it diffusion from high to low concentration? It is diffusion. We can mix out here. We can use mixing to, tr to bring the particles to the surface. But once it's at the surface and once we're in the pores, those particles, those, those molecules are going to move by diffusion into the pore space. So it's diffusion that is your rate limiting step. What can I do to increase diffusion? How can I increase, <clears throat> how can I increase diffusion? Increase temperature. I can increase temperature. So if I increase temperature, I increase diffusion. The problem is if I increase temperature, I decrease adsorption because adsorption is exothermic. So the actual process of adsorption is exothermic. So what does that mean if I have hot gases? So if my big, big combustion gas stream from a boiler, that gas is going to be hot. It just, it's coming out of the boiler. Now I'm looking at removing incom products of incomplete combustion by adsorption. What do I need to do? How do we need to cool the gas? Well, your surface condenser comes in handy. So we need to cool that gas in order for adsorption to be efficient. Because remember, adsorption is exothermic. It's important, it's important thing to remember with any sort of adsorption process. So I can increase diffusion, get those chemicals, molecules to the pores, into the pores faster, but I've decreased the adsorption capacity. I increased the rate of adsorption, but I decreased the capacity. Now I can have what we refer to as non-regenerative systems, throwaway systems. So for instance, this carbon filter, use this on a <clears throat> furnace system or a filtration unit. So in these panels, I have carbon. You put carbon in a mask in order to remove gases. We have filters. And they're actually adsorption that filters in a cigarette filter, air packs for industrial face masks, and you're, you're tossing, you're throwing away the carbon. On the other hand, I can have other types of <clears throat> larger systems. So for instance, I have a fume hood. I have a centrifugal fan pulling air from the fume hood. I may have a particulate matter filter. So, so I'm removing particulates, but that filter isn't going to remove any gases. And then I have a carbon bed. This is non-regenerative. -regener I'll throw that away, typically disposed of in a landfill. And then the clean air goes out to the atmosphere. On the other hand, I can have a regenerative system. So you can see here, I've got an, I've got an absorption bed and I have a gas stream coming in. Here it comes in. And the gas, gas, <clears throat> gaseous chemicals are adsorbed, they're attached to that material and I have clean gas out the bottom. Now, I can regenerate that by passing steam through it. So in a, this is a operational mode, service mode, and then in regeneration. So now what I'm doing is the opposite. So now I'm gonna take, we'll take steam and we're passing that steam 
through the carbon. Remember, we said carbon, the adsorption process is exothermic. So what happens now, it reverses the equilibrium and it desorbs that chemical. So now what I have here is a pollutant laden gas. If I need to recover it, put that through a condenser, you collect the condensed pollutant, and now I have clean gas coming out here. So I've regenerated that column. I've removed the chemical off of the carbon or the alumina or the silica by shifting that equilibrium by using temperature. You, so there I'm using the fact that adsorption is exothermic to my benefit. And that condenser allows me to recover that pollutant. This can be done in what we call a fixed bed. It is stationary. Think of that as the, so if this is my column here, and these are my particles, grains of activated carbon, they're stationary, they're just N, for instance, I'm passing my gas through it. A fluidized bed means that these particles are essentially floating. They're suspended. So the gas flow is sufficient. Typically it's an upflow system. And here in a fluidized bed, this way flow from the bottom and my particles of my activated carbon are suspended essentially in that gas stream. So they're actually get movement of these particles. <clears throat> and which one you use really depends on the pollutant, the recovery requirements, and also on the properties of the gas. So for instance, in a fluidized bed, if you have particulates in there, you can still use a fluidized bed because you're, you're not gonna remove the particulates, but you can still use it because you're not gonna get clogging. If you have particulates and you're using a fixed bed, you're gonna have clogging. It's just another image of a regenerative system. So we have air coming in, may have a particulate filter, Shown here, we've got a heat exchanger in order to cool that gas. And we're then treating that gas through a, for instance, an activated carbon bed. And then when we need to regenerate, then we stop this operation. So we'll stop this operation here. And instead, we'll turn on the steam. So now we're regenerating. We're desorbing that chemical and we've got the chemical laden steam that we can then further treat, for instance, with a condenser to condense that chemi those chem chemicals before we release that gas to the atmosphere. Questions about these different systems and how we use them or why we use the different systems. So, um... For like a reaction with the catalyst, that's a adsor adsorption, correct? There's no catalyst here, okay? We'll talk about catal catalysis when we talk about oxidation. So there's okay. not a reaction. It's simply, kind of think of it as a Velcro. You're throwing Velcro, okay? You throw balls at a Velcro strip and they stick. Think of it that way. Okay. Okay, so all you're doing is basically throwing Velcro molecules at that Velcro strip, which is the adsorb, the carbon, and they're sticking to the carbon. So there's no true reaction. But is like the process of the gas sticking to the carbon, activated carbon, that's the same process for like a catalyst in a reaction? Or is it mm -hmm. a different mechanism? It's different mechanism, really. I mean, a catalyst doesn't hold the molecule there. It just provides a certain, the catal catalyst provides, decreases the activation energy, essentially, so that the reaction can occur. 
Okay. Okay. So think of it that way versus a adsorbent that is the surface on which your molecule is. Okay. Thank you. It's like static. And basically talk about how that sticks. Okay. Be weak electrostatic forces. So it's when you're a kid, you have a, you blow up a balloon and you rub the balloon on your head and then you stick the balloon on the wall. Why does that happen? Electrostatic force. Electrostatic forces. Exactly. Basically you're charging the balloon surface so that when it hits the wall, it sticks to the wall. Those are weak forces. Eventually the balloon falls to the floor because there isn't sufficient electrostatic energy to keep it there. So that desorption process, when we heat it, that's changing that energy so that it desorbs. If it's a covalent or a hydrogen bonding, it's much more difficult to desorb that chemical. So for instance, the um, herbicide atrazine in soils can react to form hydroxy atrazine. So basically there's a chlorine that reacts to and is replaced by an OH. If that OH group attaches to soil by adsorption, it actually attaches by it actually attaches by covalent bonding, and it's very, very difficult to desorb that. But if it's an electrostatic reaction, think of the balloon on the wall. Eventually, it falls to the floor. <clears throat> it's a weak force. It doesn't take that much energy to bind it to the wall, but then it doesn't take that much energy to release it. So it's much easier to recover chemicals that are attached by physical absorption than it is for a chemical that is attached by what we refer to as chemisorption by the covalent or hydrogen bonding. And this is electrostatic or Vanderbilt's. So these are much weaker forces. Chemisorption is much stronger. So let's stop there. Um, We'll pick up on Wednesday with adsorption isotherms. Those of you that have had 483, we talk about this in 483, we just talk about it with water. We're gonna talk about the same thing with gas here. It is exactly the same process. Or for those of you that are going to take 483, you're gonna see this again in 483. It's an extremely important process, so I cover it in both. So we'll pick up with adsorption isotherms on Wednesday. Happy to answer any other questions and have a great day.